practice medicine deconstructed. I want all of you to know that, listen, I'm a physician. We all know that I'm a physician. I go to work every day. I practice medicine. I treat patients who are dying and I treat patients who have pulmonary problems. But my number one priority is being a parent. I'm a father and I'm a husband. I worry just like you do about coronavirus and I especially worry about it in my children and in other children. What we're gonna do today is we're gonna talk to a physician from a parent's perspective and we're gonna ask their questions. I hope you enjoy. There's a lot of stuff going on with coronavirus and we have children, we have two little girls. One's gonna start kindergarten, the other one's gonna be in... Second grade? Se second grade. And we have concerns with back to school. So I got a couple of questions. My wife has a whole notebook full of questions. Uh, we were just wondering if you can address them. Of course I can address your questions. I'm a parent too, I have a couple of kids. Do you, do you want to start? You, you want me to start? Uh, go ahead, you start. You want me to start? Sure. All right. Doc, I mean, first of all, what is coronavirus? It's a good question. So coronavirus is a type of RNA virus that's found in the world. And when you actually look at coronavirus, there are seven human coronaviruses, meaning these seven coronaviruses actually infect human beings. Four of those coronaviruses we see every single year because they cause the common cold in both children and adults. In adults, it's about 30 to 40% of the common cold is caused by coronaviruses. In children, it's a little bit less, but they're prevalent there. Now, the three most severe coronaviruses are MERS, SARS-CoV-1, and the one that you're hearing about right now, SARS-CoV-2. SARS-CoV-2 initially started in Wuhan, China, and has spread from there all over the world. And in fact, it seems as if the United States at this time seems to be the epicenter. Okay. Um, so one of my main concerns at school is, you know, some of the population believes in the virus. Some of the population thinks it's a hoax. I believe in the virus. How do I ensure that my child is protected by these kids that don't maybe know how to social distance or don't want to wear a mask? You know, I have those same concerns. It's very tough to control other people's behavior. That's why social distancing and staying at home was the most important aspect as the viral counts in the country and in the world were increasing. So it's really important to maintain your social distance. That is, keep people six feet apart also wearing a mask when you're out in public and probably wearing protective eyewear. In terms of when you're going back to school, as you know, it's a little bit hard to control for, which makes going back to school extraordinarily difficult. And you're right, there are people out there who believe that coronavirus is a hoax. Unfortunately, it looks like those people only exist in the United States, but it is happening, and that's not something that I can control. It's definitely not something that parents can control, but it's something that we all have to think about. So, in terms of transmission, are kids actually spreading the virus? I know during flu season it's a big deal about kids spreading the virus, but what about with coronavirus? Do we know anything about that? That's another great question. Here's the thing about coronavirus, what you've noticed is as soon as coronavirus started to spread across the United States, we kind of shut down schools, we shut down daycare centers, so we really don't know the transmissibility of children. However, when you look at viruses like you just mentioned, like influenza, they are a huge part of spreading influenza. I can tell you this, it doesn't seem that children are spreading coronavirus as often or as frequent as they spread influenza, but we do still think that the children's presence in school does lead to transmission. Recently, when you look at day camps in Missouri and even camps in Texas, they've had outbreaks at certain camps in which there's 1,000 or 1,300 children, and you can see that increase in spread of the virus. So we do know that children have something to do with it. Yes, their symptoms are a little bit more mild, but they definitely spread the virus because when you look at virus spread, it takes place in family clusters. That is mom, dad, child, sometimes grandpa and grandma or other children. And when one person gets it, the family ends up getting it. And that's a concern. 
because if grandchild gives it to grandma or grandpa, those are the people who are most at risk of developing severe disease, and that's a big um, I mean, I have concerns about the kids wearing masks all day. You know, you hear all these things about how it can be unhealthy or, uh, you know, for wearing it for prolonged periods of time. They're breathing in the same thing all day. Is there some truth to that? You have concerns about them wearing masks all day? It's not a big well, deal. Well, you know, we go, we, we go to Target and we're there for like 15, 20, well, let's be honest, an hour. But, you know for seven hours of the day. They can't keep their mask on for that long? Have you been to Target with them? I guess I haven't. How many times I've pulled it back over their nose? <laughs> what do you think, Doc? You know, this is the same relationship my wife and I have, and I can see it all over your faces here. So first of all, what you have to understand is that wearing a mask is really no big deal. There's lots of literature to support that masks do not cause a lowering of your oxygen level. There's also lots of literature to support that social distancing, in addition to masks, reduce your risk of obtaining the virus. So I do think it's important for children to wear the mask. As far as them wearing it all day, I understand your concern. All we can do is heavily encourage it. If a child masks fall off, we have to put it back on. That's the thing that I would stress, is that I would tell my children before they leave the house, listen, you don't want coronavirus, I need you to wear your mask. My daughter's seven years old. She's religious when it comes to her mask. And she always asks me if I have my mask before I leave for work. So our second grader in particular, she's made this core group of friendships that we really want to keep nurturing. And, but we're afraid to send her back also. So how do we kind of balance the mental health versus the physical health? Like, is there really any evidence that tells us that this is going to be a mental health issue for these children? Or is it okay for them to really miss that social interaction for up to a year? That's another great point. There's no solid, concrete evidence that shows us the long-term effects of children being absent from school and from their social environment for such a long time. What we do know is that in the United Kingdom, they had done a survey on young children up to 25 years of age who had a history of mental health disorder, and 83% of them said that their symptoms were worse during the pandemic. That's an issue, because not only is there an issue with mental health, but now you have the young adults or children noticing that issue. Moving forward, when you pull children out of school at such a young age, if they're five years old, six years old, they're gonna have trouble readjusting to go back into school. I can see that with my own children who have lost this routine of learning, which is also a problem. Another point that's been made is that when you look at domestic violence or abuse in children, look at China, their child abuse cases have tripled during the pandemic. So you can see that in some children, school, is actually safe for them and it's an outlet for them to be able to be themselves and not have that fear of being at home. That's a real issue and that's something that we haven't seen before but it's definitely something that we need to pay attention to as we weigh whether to put our children back in school full time or not. In the grand scheme of things, we know that there's a lot of people in the United States. How worse could this possibly get for children? Another great question. Let me put it to you like this. There are 74 million children less than 18 years of age in the United States, okay? For every 1% of the population that's infected with coronavirus, that's gonna be 740,000 children that's infected with coronavirus. And when you look at the pediatric intensive care unit, there's only 5,100 pediatric intensive care unit beds in the country. And so when you think about that in the grand scheme of things, in areas in which there are not a lot of pediatric intensive care unit beds, the rate can be as low as five per 100,000 kids. We're gonna run out of space. If this infection continues and the infection numbers continue to rise and that percentage of the population goes up who has the infection, there's gonna be more kids with infection. 
there's going to be more kids who are severely ill. And that's going to be a capacity problem, which was one of the main reasons for social distancing and shutting down the country was because of the capacity. As a pulmonary and critical care physician, somebody who's taking care of adult patients most of the time with this condition, we see that daily. And we're starting to see a capacity problem right now. So it is really important to pay attention to some of the points that have been made during our meeting today. So when the kids do go back to school, what are things that I can do as a parent when they come home from school to kind of keep the virus at bay? Another great question. Again, this is something that I think about daily because when I leave the ICU and I'm taking care of a coronavirus patient, I go home to my kids and my wife. So one of the things I think we're going to have to get in the habit of, and children aren't really going to like this, but when children come home from school, they're going to have to wash their hands, they're going to have to take a shower. I think that it's going to have to become a habit on a daily basis that when a child comes home from school, they got to get immediately into the shower. You can take those clothes off, you got to put them immediately in the washing machine, and you might want to leave the shoes at the front door or right outside of the front door. These are things that are going to have to happen. Hopefully the child has worn a mask all day. If it's a cloth mask, you're going to have to take that cloth mask and you're going to have to wash it and dry it to make certain that it's clean and ready for the next day. So listen, I know all the focus has been on our children because that's who we care about and that's who we take to and from school, take them to wherever they need to go and we worry about their social habits. And a couple of weeks ago, I was in on the side of they need to go back to school. But now after the last couple of weeks and looking at countries such as Australia, New Zealand, and looking at the news, I see that there's some uptick in infections. Uh -huh. And I know myself, I was leaving out the teacher. That's and so I wonder if, and I wonder your opinion on thinking about the teacher and how they play into all of this, because I understand that teachers are older and they're probably the ones that are more at risk. That's another very good point and a very good question. I was where you were. I thought a couple of weeks ago, let's let the kids go back to school. They're not transmitting the virus to one another as much. They are a low risk group in general. It's safe for them to go back to school. I thought that way. It was a very selfish way to think because I wasn't thinking about the kid's biggest hero in their life. And that's their teacher. A teacher is a hero. But what else is a teacher? A teacher is also elderly. Teachers are 50 and 60 years old. This is the group of people who tend to do poorly when they contract the virus. And what are they every day in front of that classroom, in front of a group of kids, exposing themselves to coronavirus? So we need to protect the teachers in some way, shape, or form. And I don't think that we've done a great job necessarily of doing that. I looked at data in Australia, and this is when I originally thought it's okay to get kids back in school. They had a couple of kids that had an infection and were surrounded by up to like 900 people, and no one got the infection, which was absolutely astonishing. And it was something where I was like, wow, kids aren't really spreading it all that much. But what's happening in Australia now? They're getting an uptick of virus patients, and we can see it on a daily basis right now. The only country that I consider that's doing really, really well is Denmark. And here's an interesting fact about Denmark. Do you know when they decided to shut down their country? They shut down their country when there were only 500 infected patients. Now they have 12,000 infections, but they only have less than 100 people getting infected on a daily basis, which is a great number. And they're slowly starting to reopen. And I think that I wish the United States would have mirrored Denmark. I'm not saying Denmark is a better country. I'm not saying I don't love the United States. All I'm saying is that if we comply as civilians with the mask wearing, the hand washing, and actually believing that this virus is not a hoax, because it's not, then perhaps we'll be able to open up the country like we all want to. Okay. Don't, don't forget this question. Oh. Okay, um, kind of just piggybacking on what I asked earlier, um, I mean, one of my main concerns is the kids wearing their mask. I mean, I can barely get them to keep their shoes on. How are they going to wear their mask all day? Do you have suggestions? Um, should they wear a face shield instead? Is that just as effective? 
I mean, I guess really what can the schools do to help prevent transmission between children and children taking that virus back home to their parents or to their grandparents? Those are all great points and great questions. And again, I'm a parent too. So I see different strategies on a daily basis of personal protective equipment. And the other day I saw something that was amazing. It was almost like a pair of glasses that had a face shield over it and covered the face. And it was an elderly person who brought it in my office. But that is something that I think a child would wear easier than a mask. Okay, doc, listen. So I watch the news, she watches the news. Every time I come home, the news is on. It's always about coronavirus. We recently saw, maybe not that recent, maybe a couple of months ago, we saw that children were getting this gnarly inflammatory syndrome and kids were in the ICU. You know, do you have any experience with that? We understand you're not specifically a pediatrician, but do you have any experience in seeing those kinds of cases or hearing about those kinds of cases? Because I know it worries the hell out of me and Same. I think it worries her too. Another good question. So the syndrome that you're referring to is called multi-system inflammatory syndrome. And what it is, is it's an exaggeration of the inflammatory response. When I say, or when we say inflammatory response, what we mean is the activation of the immune system to do its job. Here's what happens in kids. If you're less than 21, if you have fever, if you have elevation in inflammatory markers, what we'll say is we'll look for your organ dysfunction. If you have a bunch of organs that are abnormal, in other words, some of their markers are elevated, we're gonna say you have multi-system inflammatory syndrome. Now, what that means is because of SARS coronavirus type 2's presence, either in the lung, because it binds so tightly to the lung cells, to the vascular cells, and to your intestinal cells, the immune system gets this alarm, and the immune system overreacts to this binding. And as it's overreacting to this binding, the immune cells clog up the organs. What do I mean by that? So let's look at the lungs, for example. The lungs are essentially a bunch of balloons that are stacked on top of one another. Those balloons are normally supposed to be filled with air, air that we breathe every single day. When those balloons cannot be filled with air because they're full of white blood cells and other proteinaceous material that they recruit, then the lung can no longer do its job. The lung is an end organ. So if that end organ can't do its job, unfortunately, you die. And in children, we looked at 186 of them with multi-system inflammatory syndrome, 130 of them did well and were discharged. Four out of those 186 did pass away. And unfortunately, as more kids get diagnosed with infection, you're going to see more of the multi-system inflammatory syndrome. And the most important thing is to recognize it early so we can treat these kids with steroids, we can treat these kids with a medicine called IVIG, and medicines that inhibit some of these molecules that lead to the cellular recruitment to certain areas. That's what's important, but that's a good point and that's something we're going to see more of. So in addition to that, I have a lot of parent friends mm -hmm. that um, have kids with asthma and that's one of their primary concerns. That's one of their biggest fears is sending their kids back and just kind of the unknown with these underlying conditions. So the children who actually contract this illness, so some of them, and maybe perhaps most of them, as more data comes out, do have some medical history, okay? Diabetes, obviously, is a strong risk factor. In children, it's immunosuppression, it's congenital heart defects, as well as maybe asthma. When you look at asthma, though, overall, it actually turns out that it may not be a risk factor for severe illness. And this is something that I've talked about a lot. And it's also something that I've talked about on Shameless Plug, my YouTube channel, Medicine Deconstructed. Thank you guys so much for watching. I really hope you learned something. If you learned something, write it down in the comments. Go ahead and subscribe. If you have ideas for future episodes, please let me know. Right now, I'm gonna be off like my shoe, which is off white. Take care. All right, now we're cats. Now we're cats. <laughs> 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 <laughs>